Uh, so today we'll be talking about the metabolic basis of autism with epilepsy. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Really uh, appreciate it. I appreciate that you're um, interested in this topic. Um, so um, I just uh, go through, I'm sorry the slides have to be like this, but otherwise it doesn't work. So you'll just see the, the preview on the side. So just my disclaimer, you know, we talk about uh, treatments. You know, not every treatment is FDA approved. In fact, many times, especially in autism, we use things off label. You know, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you make sure that you're um, educated, you know, um, you're a physician and, you know, you can prescribe medicine and then you um, are educated in the, um, in the risks and benefits of those medications. Just my um, disclosures, some of my research funding on some advisory boards. So the first thing um, I'll talk about is this is a really a very interesting area um, of, of autism and medicine. And we recognized many years ago that there was really a, a dearth of information about uh, treatment for seizures in uh, children with autism spectrum disorders. And really, I went to review the literature in a, in a group. Um, one of the things we did is, uh, I'm not going to show you the part of the paper, but the part of the paper we looked at all the, the treatments. But what we also did is looked at specific syndromes, particularly metabolic syndromes, that uh, could respond to specific treatments if a child had epilepsy, which is important to identify and treat to optimize um, their, um, their response. Um, and uh, things that we um, identified were mitochondrial disease, where you can give kind of a mitochondrial cocktail, including carnitine and sort of multivitamins and, and acetylcysteine, a cerebral folate deficiency, where folinic fol acid or leucovorin could be given, urea cycle disorders, which have seizures many times, um, and it's important to use a, a low protein diet if they have that. Um, 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 other types of um, disorders, um, so we'll go into some of these disorders uh, specifically and talk about some of the disorders that we see a lot and can really be um, very much um, involved in uh, seizures and it's important to identify and treat them. The first one we'll talk about is cerebral folate deficiency. You know, as you might know, folate is very, very, very important. And, and why is it important? Well, we can look here, we see the folate cycle, which is in the middle here. Um, now, a folic acid, one of the things we have to remember is folic acid is the synthetic oxidized form of folate. So it has to be reduced to dihydrofolate reductase, and many people have a polymorphism uh, that stops that. And what we're learning is that folic acid builds up and actually can inhibit folate metabolism. So instead, we want to give reduced folates when we give folates, such as leucovorin or 5-methotetrahydrofolate. We like leucovorin for a number of reasons. It comes in before the MTHFR, um, but the uh, gut, your gut bacteria actually um, transform half of it into methotetrahydrofolate. So you actually get best of both worlds because it comes into both sides of the MTHFR. Um, over here, 5 methotetrahydrofolate is very important for methylation, and B12 is important to support that. And methylation is very important for epigenetics and enzyme regulation, turning on and off our genes. And downstream, it's important for producing glutathione to protect our body and redox metabolism. On the other side, where actually leucovorin comes in, we make purines, and purines are very important. They're um, the, some of the basis of RNA and DNA, so you can have problems with gene repair if you don't have enough purines. And GTP, which is derived from purines, makes BH4, which is a cofactor for making all the monoamine neurotransmitters, serotonin, melatonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, as well as nitric oxide production, which is very important for blood flow. And um, one of the other purines makes, uh, is the basis for ATP, which, as we know, is important for mitochondrial energy production. It's the currency of energy in our body. 
Um, folate is also very, very important in the mitochondria and many of the um, uh, pathways, some of the pathways for, um, for making important um, cofactors are in the mitochondria and use uh, folate. So what's really important um, to recognize is that um, folate um, and everything that uh, has to get into the brain can't just diffuse into the brain. It actually has to be carried into the brain um, some way. Um, and the way that folate is carried into the brain is by something called the folate receptor alpha. And we can see that 5-methyltetrahydrofolate binds onto that, and that's an active process which pulls this across um, the cell, the quarry plexus epithelial cell, and dumps it out into the CSF. So folate receptor alpha is really important because it likes folate a lot. It has a high affinity for folate. We also have a backup system called the reduced folate carrier. Um, however, you can see this is smaller than the folate receptor alpha because it doesn't like folate as much. So really to get it through, you have to kind of push it through the reduced folate carrier if you want to get folate into the brain. And one of the reasons why it's um, hard to get adequate levels of folate in the brain um, is because the levels of folate in the brain are two to three times higher that of that in the blood. So it can't just diffuse into the brain, it actually has to be actively pulled into the brain. So in 2005, um, really was the uh, seminal paper on cerebral folate deficiency in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, uh, really by Dr. Rainmakers and Dr. Quatros. Um, and Dr. Rainmakers had described some patients with cerebral folate deficiency earlier, but he didn't really know why that was. Dr. Quatros found out that we have these autoantibodies, some people have these autoantibodies running around their blood that bind onto the folate receptor and prevent it from working. The classic form of cerebral folate deficiency is really a neurodevelopmental regression um, and loss of skills um, a little bit before a year of age, um, acquired microcephaly so the head does not grow, unrest and irritability, insomnia, uh, hypertonia and ataxia, then turning into long track signs as more spasticity, sometimes as movement disorders, um, and epilepsy is a prominent feature. So um, in this study, they asked, well, what was really the reason for um, having the, uh, the problems of getting folate? And they found out that, uh, that overall, the patients with cerebral folate deficiency had quite a high titer of this antibody that blocked the transport mechanism of folate in the brain. And they found that none of the patients had any genetic abnormalities in the uh, folate. Um, so, um, so this is a diagram um, of, um, um, of how these antibodies work. So there's two types of antibodies that we look at. There's a, a blocking antibody, and the blocking antibody binds on to the folate receptor alpha in the place that folate's supposed to bind and prevents folate from binding. And then we have something called the binding antibody that binds on to the folate receptor and just kind of messes up its, uh, its function. And some of this, uh, Dr. Quattro so showed, this may cause inflammation actually here on the, in the coronary plexus. So in order to treat this, what we do is we use the reduced folate carrier um, and um, um, we give high doses of reduced folates in the form of um, leucovorin um, to uh, push it through the reduced folate carrier and into the brain. Um, we have evidence, there's two studies that have, um, that have validated the antibody by looking at CSF levels and show that there's a correlation between the titer of the blocking antibody um, and the folate levels in the CSF. So um, when some of the um, early studies, um, when they describe patients with cerebral folate deficiency, uh, many of them had symptoms of autism. Uh, so we said, huh, well, how many kids with autism have this folate receptor? 
So I teamed up with Dan Rosignol and uh, we uh, um, offered the test, um, Doctor, it was the Dr. Quattro's antibody test at that time, to patients that were coming through our clinic to see how many of them might have the antibody. And it ended up, it was a lot. That 60% of children with autism that we saw had the blocking antibodies and 50% had the binding antibodies. And overall, 75% of the children that we saw in our clinic had one of the two antibodies. So then what we did is we said, well, if you have the antibodies, we actually offer them, do you want a lumbar puncture to look at the level of folate? Or since leucovorin is pretty safe, we'll offer you a treatment and follow you up closely to see if it works. And so what we did is we gave the parents questionnaires to ask about um, nine different areas um, of, um, of behavior and cognition and language that's important to autism. And what we found out is that uh, the children with the antibody that were put on leucovorin, um, that two thirds of them had improvements in language, receptive language, expressive language, and verbal communication. Um, and there was improvement in stereotype behavior um, and attention. What we did is we used a wait list control. So we had patients that uh, were waiting for results and didn't make any other changes to um, their, um, their therapies. And we used them as a control group um, and they were followed up about the same time as the other patients. So um, this was our first study that we showed that leucovorin really could help. We've done a, uh, so in our recent review um, on cerebral folate deficiency and the folate receptor alpha antibodies and leucovorin, um, we looked at um, the response to leucovorin um, by treatment of um, uh, um, in cerebral folate deficiency in children with and without autism. And what we found is that children with autism that had uh, cerebral folate problems, if they had epilepsy, 75% of them responded to leucovorin um, by um, improving their seizures, which is pretty significant. If you didn't have autism, it was a little bit less at about 50%. Of course, leucovorin also improved many other symptoms, but here we're talking about epilepsy. We can see that really there's quite improvement in epilepsy with just giving uh, leucovorin a very simple and uh, safe treatment. The second thing we'll talk about is mitochondrial disorders. The mitochondria, as you may know, is the powerhouse in the cell. Um, it, uh, every, almost every cell in our body have mitochondria, and we have somewhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of mitochondria um, in the cell, depending on how much energy we need. Mitochondria is very complex. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane, and it actually has its own DNA. So, um, you know, we think of all of our DNA being on our chromosomes here in the middle of a cell, but um, there's one other place in our cell that we have DNA, and that's in the mitochondria. So it has its own DNA. Interestingly, most of the genes that control the mitochondria are on the chromosomes, but some of the genes are on the mitochondrial DNA. And since it has the DNA in there, of course, it needs all the machinery to translate and, and, um, and uh, the, uh, the DNA and make proteins. Um, um, and so we have a very complicated system within the mitochondria. It's a very complicated organelle. So um, about 10 years ago, you know, we uh, realized that more and more um, evidence was coming out or more and more reports were coming out of mitochondrial dysfunction in autism. And so myself and, and Dan Rosignol uh, decided to do something called a meta-analysis meta and systematic review to see what the evidence was. And we found out that classic mitochondrial disease um, diagnosed in autism, it could be diagnosed in about 5% of the kiddos with autism. But when we looked at the biomarkers of, um, um, of mitochondrial disease, that's an elevated lactate pyruvate, lactate to pyruvate ratio, uh, we found that it was much higher. The prevalence of increased lactate 
was 31 percent, and that's across six studies that we combined. Uh, ev the um, elevation in lactic to pyruvate ratio was almost 30 percent. Elevation of alanine, which is a, a proxy for lactate, because lactate is uh, metabolized to alanine, was up was eight percent of low carnitine, 90 percent. So um, there was a discrepancy between the diagnosis of classic mitochondrial disorder and the uh, biomarkers for mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's where we consider that there's other types of mitochondrial dysfunction of kids in autism that doesn't fall into classic mitochondrial disease. What we did is we um, then compared, we said, well, the kids with mitochondrial disease and autism, are they different than the kids with just autism? Um, and um, what we found is that kids that have mitochondrial disease and autism are more likely to have a neurodevelopmental regression, so 50% of them versus generalized ASD, 25%, and they're much more likely to have seizures, 41%, as opposed to 11% in general ASD. Um, they tend to have motor delays um, and GI abnormalities. And interestingly, when, we, when they looked for genes that, uh, that uh, could explain the mitochondrial disease, it was only found in about 23% um, of the kiddos. So suggesting that there's maybe other reasons for the mitochondrial disease. But of course, this high rate of seizures is very important. So why is the mitochondria important in our neurons? So neurons have high energy demand. They, they account for, um, the brain accounts for 20% of resting metabolic energy of our body. And it's not 20% the size of our body. So neurons require a lot of energy. Um, and the mitochondria are really important um, all over the place. Mitochondria um, are important in the uh, body of the neuron because there's many metabolic processes. Um, mitochondria then are actually made in the body of the neuron. It's very complex and they actually travel down the axon all the way to the end. So it takes some energy and um, just, just to get them where they need to go. And then they're very, very um, important in both the synapses, uh, where you know different, uh, where we have our neurotransmitters and we have to regulate ions, pump them in and out, and also the nodes of Ramvier. Again, these are places where there's a, a collection of ion channels, which and um, have to be stabilized with um, with uh, several. Um, pumps, ion pumps, so they need lots of energy for the neuron to work. And this is a, um, uh, a picture of um, the, uh, uh, the neurons. You have your microtubules that go from the body of the neurons um, down to the synaptic terminal, and there's little motors that, uh, that will move the mitochondria actually from the body of the cell all the way down. And there's genetic disorders we found that have actual uh, neurologic issues where there's problems with these motors um, and um, it affects very long neurons as you would expect. So why is the mitochondria um, important? Well one thing is that uh, these uh, synaptic synapses are recycling all the time and then you have all these ion pumps you see here. So you need ATP for all of this um, and so the mitochondria is very important in recycling um, the neurotransmitters and in the regulation of the uh, potential, the electrical potential um, in the neuron. Um, um, it's, uh, it's very important uh, to realize the mitochondrial can be, become damaged too um, with the cytotoxicity. And um, in both seizures and in autism, we see very high levels of excitatory neurotransmitters that uh, open up um, NMDA and other calcium channels. And if there's too much calcium, it actually can cause oxidative stress and damage the mitochondria. So calcium influx um, can um, um, uh, result in cell death signals um, and also change the metabolism um, within the citric acid cycle. 
The really important thing is that uh, the mitochondria is actually involved in um, creating um, uh, neurotransmitters. So it's actually involved in creating GABA, which is our major um, inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so one of the problems in both seizures and autism is we have too much excitation, too much glutamate, and not enough GABA inhibition. And so the mitochondria is very important in making GABA um, for that inhibition um, of the synapse. Uh, the mitochondria is very complex. Um, the, uh, for the most part, we, a lot of times we think about carbohydrate metabolism. Carbohydrates in the form of pyruvate come into the um, citric acid cycle here, as you can see. Um, and then um, the um, what we call electron carriers move to the electron transport chain here, which is the complexes one, two, three, four, and five. And five makes our ATP, our energy. So um, how do we treat this? What is important in the mitochondria? So one of the things that's very, very important, I think underappreciated, is CoQ10, or we use the form Wabiquinol. Wabiquinol is a more bioavailable form um, of CoQ10. And why is CoQ10 so important? Well, CoQ10, I like to describe it, it's actually the wires that connect complex one and complex three and complex two and complex three. So it actually carries the, uh, the um, energy molecules from both complex one and complex two to complex three. So without it, you're going to interrupt the electron transport chain and it won't work. The problem is when you have mitochondrial dysfunction is that CoQ10 is also an antioxidant. So um, if you um, have an antioxidant, if it's, it's being um, um, used up as an antioxidant, it won't be available um, for, um, for, uh, for use um, in the electron transport chain and the mitochondria won't work. So that's why we need high levels of it when we have mitochondrial dysfunction. CoQ10 is also important actually for recharging some of the important vitamins that we have, which are antioxidants, including vitamin E and vitamin C. Other treatments that are very important um, that we know for mitochondria include, you know, um, the, uh, the B vitamins um, and, um, and things like copper and iron, um, actually. So um, when we look at the treatment um, for mitochondrial disorders, um, there's um, no, um, uh, there's, uh, there's, um, um, there's some, you know, uh, treatments um, that have been, um, uh, have been multivitamins that have been created um, for, um, uh, for treating mitochondrial issues, but only some of them have been, there's, there's only one that has been tested on kids with autism, and that's, uh, and um, Dr. Jim Adams created this multivitamin that has mitochondrial support um, and, um, and, and did a study on children with autism to see if there was evidence that it actually improved function. And his vitamin and mineral supplement he, um, he used um, uh, are, is shown here. And he found that uh, it improved ATP and the levels of electron carriers as well as CoQ10 and improved receptive language, hyperactivity, and tantruming, and um, overall improvements. And this is a placebo-controlled study. The other real um, important treatment is carnitine. Um, and carnitine has not been tried on kids with autism and mitochondrial dysfunction but has been used in autism in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial and using the CARS, the Childhood Autism Rating Scale, um, it was found that, it, that giving carnitine, which uh, supports the mitochondria and is very important for the mitochondria, um, actually improves the CARS score in those that received it versus placebo. There is also 
improvement in the, uh, the uh, um, clinical global impression scale and the cognitive subscale of the ATEC. Um, and it was actually found that there was um, a correlation between increasing carnitine um, improvement in carnitine scores, um, in CAR scores, and in muscle strength. Other treatments um, that are really important um, for that can be helpful um, for many things for seizures um, themselves, but also seizures when there's mitochondrial dysfunction um, is the ketogenic diet. So here we see a case study um, which um, shows us the effect of the ketogenic diet. And you can see this uh, child with refractory epilepsy, their EEG has all these spikes. Then they were put on the uh, gluten-free, casein-free ketogenic diet, and you can see the EEG normalized. So the ketogenic diet seems to be good for a number of things. Uh, one, it's a treatment for epilepsy, but there's evidence that it's good for mitochondrial disease, and there's also um, evidence that it's good for, for autism symptoms. So really, you can kind of kill three birds with one stone um, using it. The other, the other important um, aspect of mitochondrial disorders, which is very important, is looking at the secondary effects of mitochondrial disorders. That is that, um, you know, we try and treat the mitochondria so it works better, but it all, the mitochondria also causes problems in many other areas of the body. So in that sense, it's important to treat those other symptoms um, if you can't optimally fix the uh, mitochondria. And of course, something that we see that's very major is, um, is GI dysfunction and dysmotility. Also, it affects the adrenal glands. The thyroid glands are very dependent on mitochondrial function as is the immune system. It's important to see if there's immune defect or a lot of times we see autoimmune conditions. Uh, cardiovascular dysfunction can be seen. And then brain dysfunction. So it ends up that, uh, that um, we are talking about cerebral folate deficiency and how the, um, the uh, process has to actually pull folate into the brain. Well, that takes energy. So we see in metabolic disorders and mitochondrial disorders that there is a type of uh, cerebral folate deficiency even without the antibodies. And so it's important to treat that to get optimal outcomes um, from children. Of course, one of the major things we see is seizures that are important and neurotransmitter deficits, particularly acetylcholine um, and, um, um, and the excitatory inhibitory balance. Um, and for that, we know that kids with autism, that um, there's evidence that uh, certain medications that improve um, acetylcholine, that is galantamine, um, has a greater recommendation B. This is a review that Dr. Rosenwell and I did um, on Alzheimer's disease medications and autism spectrum disorder. So galantamine is very good for improving um, acetylcholine, and there's um, good evidence and mementine or nemenda is good um, that, that uh, blocks the excitatory system, so it calms down the brain. And we know that some of the uh, reasons why we have seizures is too much excitation. So mementine or um, uh, nemenda can be used in those contexts. Uh, we know it also improves other um, uh, symptoms in autism, including language and social interactions emotional um, lability, uh, repetitive behaviors, um, and um, overall autism symptoms. So lastly, the other um, disorder that's associated with, um, with seizures um, in autism is uh, the creatine deficiency syndromes. And these are just being more and more recognized recently. So creatine is very important. Um, it um, is produced in the body, and there's several steps um, made starting out with glycine and L-arginine. Um, we make GAA and then creatine, and then creatine has to be transported into the brain. Again, everything goes into the brain needs to be transported there. And we actually see abnormalities 
in each one of the both of these enzymes um, ends in this transporter transporting uh, creatine um, into the brain. Uh, so why is creatine so important? Um, well, creatine is very involved in energy metabolism. What it does is we can think of it almost as the um, as the batteries uh, of the cell. That is, it stores energy, so energy can be used quickly. You know, the mitochondria can only work so fast. So um, the mitochondria stores energy in the, um, in the form of creatine. And it's important, especially in mitochondrial disorders, to supplement creatine uh, because you want more of that storage, right? Since the mitochondria isn't working very well, you want to store up more um, energy uh, so the individual has more energy despite their mitochondria not working well. Um, it improves fatigue too in mitochondrial disorders. So um, the uh, so these um, deficiencies of the enzymes that produce creatine and the transporter disorder um, all have um, common um, symptoms, including cognitive dysfunction and seizures. So seizures are seen in all of these disorders, mostly the GAMT deficiency and the transporter disorder. We see epilepsy and seizures. We also see behavioral problems and we see autism spectrum disorder in uh, creatine deficiency. So um, treatments for creatine, uh, supplements with um, creatine monohydrate um, at uh, pretty high doses, 400 to 800 milligrams per kilogram in three to six divided doses um, is the treatment um, um, successful. It's a hard disorder to treat, and here there's only one report of a person achieving normal development um, with uh, um, uh, the creatine supplementation. But you can make the, the children better. Seizure freedom was achieved in 50% of the cases. Movement disorders uh, are a very big sign, and those were improved in um, 50% of the cases. Um, also, there's, um, there's other uh, dietary uh, changes um, um, that uh, can be needed, in, including supplementing um, orthene and uh, restricting um, um, arginine. Um, so the AGAT disorder, again, supplemental supplemented with creatine. Um, and people that were symptomatic for the disorder showed improvement in muscle weakness but not improvement um, in cognitive function um, if the initiation of the treatment was after the age of 10. If you treat early, before the age of two, you may um, improve cognitive function um, and, um, and in asymptomatic children that were uh, treated very early on, uh, they, um, uh, they uh, were achieved normal development. And then probably the most hardest one to treat is the creatine transporter disorder. And you have to give um, high doses of creatine monohydrate, arginine, um, and glycine. Um, and um, it's, a, you know, it's a hard disorder to treat. Um, many do not fully recover, but it's important to recognize and treat the disorder as it's been starting to be um, recognized more and more in autism. And with that, I thank you for your attention. So I'll answer some of um, these questions. Uh, it says, my son was on keto, but his nails got brittle. I thought that wasn't normal. He also lost too much weight. Yeah, it is a problem with the ketogenic diet that um, is uh, that there's um, um, that um, there can be too much weight loss. Um, people are experimenting with more of the modified Atkins diet, 
You know, in our seizure survey that we did um, back about 10 years ago, seeing what treatments are best, they found that the ketogenic diet far and away was really rated as one of the best treatments for um, uh, treating seizures um, and that the modified Atkins diet did improve seizures, but not to the same extent. But the ketogenic diet does have some side effects you have to watch out for. Um, and if the child can't tolerate it, they could try a modified Atkins diet. Um, what about hormones? Um, yeah, to control seizures, especially in girls. It's a really, that's a great question. Um, so um, the, uh, that estrogen tends to be um, seizuregenic. So many times um, some um, um, uh, treatments to, uh, to decrease estrogen, increase progesterone um, are used. Um, yeah, so um, treating um, high levels of PKU with Kuvan, uh, that's, yes, I think uh, Biomarin um, was doing studies on that and they, uh, that it's indicated, Kuvan's actually indicated um, as an adjunctive treatment for PKU. And so it, um, it can um, uh, uh, be, um, uh, be used. The PowerPoint, I believe, will be online. So are ticks related to seizure activity? Um, not really, but you can have ticks, things that look like ticks that are seizures. Usually ticks are ticks, but many times um, if you have seizures, you could have uh, um, actually epileptiform discharges that look like seizures. So, you know, I think it's always important to get an EEG uh, to rule that out. Let's see. Um, B BH4 cycle disorders, yeah. Um, they're very important. We don't see seizures a lot with them, so that's why I didn't discuss them. Um, uh, but BH4, of course, is very important for neurotransmitters, all the monoamine neurotransmitters. Um, and um, it can be very helpful um, in kids with, uh, um, with um, autism and other developmental disorders. Uh, we did a biomarker study on treatment with um, BH4 and autism. We found that most of the, its effect was um, by treating nitric, nitric oxide metabolism, actually. So one of the good things is that with cerebral folate deficiency, folate is the precursor uh, to BH4. Um, and there's studies that have shown in cerebral folate deficiency by giving leucoborin, you actually can normalize BH4 levels. Um, so that's why um, leucoborin uh, tends to be a good treatment that helps in many uh, domains. How are these deficiencies discovered? Well, um, if they're suspected, um, a mo metabolic workup should be done. Uh, personally, for every child I see, I look for mitochondrial disorders and cerebral folate uh, problems in children with autism or other, other neurodevelopmental disorders. I look for creatine uh, deficiencies, particularly if there's bad movement disorders. Okay, so um, what about supplements for mitochondrial? I use CoQ10, carnitine. They're very important. So. The, um, so the basis, the starting basis I use for, my, um, for mitochondrial treatment is one, Wabiquinol, um, because it's the activated form of CoQ10. Again, extremely important. Uh, two, a multivitamin that targets mitochondrial function, you know, and there's, uh, there's many of them, you know, including uh, spectrum needs and energy needs uh, seem to be helpful. Um, the uh, vitamin that Dr. Adams has put together also um, has mitochondrial support um, and, um, and has um, evidence um, that it's helpful in autism. But, it, it, you know, different children, you know, it's good that we have many different choices because uh, many different children, you know, tolerate one or the other um, better. Um, but you want a multivitamin that's, that fills in those gaps, especially uh, with many of the B vitamins. Uh, that are important for mitochondrial function um, and carnitine is especially important. So then I give extra carnitine. Carnitine is important for um, many reasons. Um, one of them is uh, its main, um, its main uh, um, um,
function is to move fats uh, around the cells, in and out of the cells. Um, so that's very important because you don't want fats become oxidized if you have too many fats in the cell, um, um, if there's oxidative stress. And it's also good if the mitochondria isn't working, then you get buildup of organic acids. And carnitine is good in binding onto them and then um, getting them out of the body. So high dose of carnitine is good when there's mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. And then there's other treatments too, creatine, especially when there's uh, fatigue. Um, other people have using, been using the forms of NAD. Um, uh, NAD seems to not only you know, be an important supplement for function in the mitochondria, but it actually um, activates something called the sirtuins, which um, upregulate um, parts of the cell that repair the mitochondria. So my son is epileptic. Do these kids, um, are they deficient? Some of them are, you know, um, and uh, that's why um, kids, especially with refractory epilepsy, um, I believe, you know, should get a workup for some of these same disorders because um, it, uh, it can really help with treatment, uh, at least in kids with autism and epilepsy. I have seen um, improvements with uh, finding these disorders and treating them. I mean, some of them still need to be on anti-epileptic medications, but we get their seizures under control. The FRAT test uh, for the antibodies, that's really your uh, only option right now. Uh, and yes, I, that's what I use. And I, I would recommend it because if you're FRAT positive, the treatment with Lucavorin is very easy, um, it's safe, and can be very helpful and, uh, and um, really cause amazing gains. Um, so, of course, you know, in epilepsy, there, there are epilepsies um, that, uh, that respond to folate, and there are some epileptic medications that do make you deficient in folate. So for certain medications, you should be taking extra folate. So let's see if there's anything else. Um, so, um, okay. Um, where can you make an appointment? Um, um, I'm, I see patients through the Rosignol Medical Center, um, and you can just Google them online. Uh, they come up um, pretty readily, um, and uh, you can send an inquiry or you can call uh, to make an appointment. For ASD, 18-year-old daughter, nonverbal on periods one year, on periods for one year, and mitochondrial issues in oats, how to solve severe sleep issues now with low zinc, iron, and high serotonin levels. Yeah, um, so sleep is very, very important. It's very important for mitochondria, if you have mitochondrial issues, because if you, uh, if you don't sleep, then the body doesn't have time to rest and repair. So, you know, that's the first thing I, I, I do when I see a patient is really work on sleep because sleep is so um, very important. Um, and uh, working on the mitochondrial problems are important. Zinc is important. Iron is important. So there's a lot of issues there uh, that need to be solved um, and take them one by one. And so, um, yeah, I, I encourage you to try and um, fix those deficiencies to, to really um, prove, uh, improve her health and optimize her health. My son was positive for frets, for the binding, negative for blocking. All other parameters you mentioned are okay. Should I add Lucavorin and what dose? Um, uh, so uh, so Lucavorin is, um, does seem to help when um, the, um, uh, the folate autoantibody is positive. We showed that in our um, double-blind placebo control study. Um, and uh, I can't give you um, dosing recommendations um, you know, um, uh, in this presentation, um, but uh, definitely work with a medical professional uh, because it could be a good treatment uh, for your son. Um, so yeah, the dosages of Lucavorin, it really depends um, on the child. We're just starting to learn at what the doses are. Some kids need higher doses, especially if there's mitochondrial dysfunction. People have gone up to eight milligrams per kilogram to so, um, but uh, that's something you should work with a medical professional. Um, so supplementing with creatine. Creatine is very helpful for fatigue. So if you're seeing fatigue, um, it can be uh, very helpful. 
uh, elevated P6 and P12 on the blood test. So a lot of times our philosophy is, of course, you know, I can't give medical advice, but um, when we see high levels um, of B12, like B12 and B6, we find it, and you're not supplementing it, um, we find that as a, um, um, a, um, 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 as a sign that the, um, that the, um, that the, um, uh, uh, um, that those vitamins are not getting into the, um, uh, into the cells. That is, you're measuring this in the blood, um, and uh, you're not measuring it, you know, in the, um, 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 you're not measuring it um, in the cells. And so uh, many times that could be a sign that there's a problem transporting these into the cells. And so just like folate, we know that uh, some people have polymorphisms on the uh, cobalamin carrier which uh, can prevent B12 from being transported um, into the cell. Um, and uh, so um, it's, uh, um, it's important to, um, to look at that. And there's other tests that may be able to confirm whether metabolically you have enough B12. So I really don't go in levels. I really look at metabolic, um, the metabolic endpoints that can tell us if there's enough B12 or B6. Um, so um, genetic disorders are interesting because we're finding more and more this common thread that we're finding mitochondrial disorders and cerebral folate issues, oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, all um, is, seems to be common themes in many genetic disorders. So um, I see a lot of patients with genetic disorders where we've actually found these abnormalities and treated them and the children have done uh, very well. Um, so um, high ammonia in the blood, depending on um, how high um, the, uh, the ammonia is, it can be caused by a mitochondrial disorder. So the urea cycle that processes the ammonia is in the mitochondria. And so um, mild elevations in ammonia are sometimes seen in mitochondrial disorders. Very high levels of ammonia um, would you need to consider what we call urea cycle disorders, which are somewhat different. Um, not sure if there's a proper question considering the topic being covered. What is my opinion on Epsom salt baths as you so uh, Epsom salt baths are great, especially before a um, bed. Um, they're very calming um, and can help with sleep. So um, yes, <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, Epsom salt baths, yeah, they can be very calming and, and they're really, they're really great uh, if you can do that and they, they can help with sleep. So yeah, if there's no more questions, I, I thank you guys for attending. I hope this was useful um, and I hope you got something out of this um, and I thank you for attending.